you can give me a second, I will um, start us off. Thanks. So good evening, everyone. And I want to thank our senior staff for being here as we do our first uh, town hall with respect to reopening. And uh, I'll ask Dr. Morgan if you could, or the slide can get put up um, that has our reopening um, slideshow. I'll first like to state uh, during this time, we see, received over 350 questions and we tried to within these slides answer these questions. I'm gonna put something up called the road forward. Our presentation is grounded in the thing called the road forward. We have at the link on our website. It's also at the end of this presentation. This presentation will be on our website tomorrow. So you can review it if you need to and see it again. Again, we are grounding our things in the road back and the road forward uh, that's, that's been uh, published by the Department of Education and the Department of Health. So if we can put the presentation up, I will start. We're gonna put it up right now. Thank you, Dave. Again, thank you. So, Dave, you can go to the next slide for me. I have Andre in the room right next to you, and he's helping with the Great. presentation. So. Thank you, Andre. So, again, the purpose of this town hall is to share with the public our plans for reopening and receive public comment as required by the American Rescue Plan. At the end of our meeting, I'm going to try to answer questions that were sent to our, our reopening email during our presentation. For instance, we're checking this, this email constantly. We received a question a few minutes ago asking, will we go, will we be going virtual in the November and holiday holiday seasons? The answer to that question at this point is no. The only, only reason we will go virtual is that the governor or the Department of Health informs us we cannot go in person. Again, the answer to that question regarding going virtual during the holiday season is no. The only reason we can go virtual, the only way we could go virtual, with a director from the, from the state or the health department. So thank you. And let's, and I also want to just talk about how we, why we granted ourselves in the road forward. The road forward gives us guidelines, guidelines that we have to be within and use to make sure we reopen safely and in person. I'll do this again, five days a week, six hours a day. The guidelines to help school districts such as ourselves reopen publicly five days a week, six hours a day. These guidelines give us regulations. This presentation will not be the end of it all. We will constantly communicate. We will be working again with our reopening committees. We are, we are tasked by the Department of Education to continue to reopen committees, I believe, into, until 2023. I hope I'm, proper, I'm saying that correctly, Dr. Morgan, until 2023. So we'll be working constantly with our reopen committees to continue to evolve. This is a living document. I want to thank everyone on the reopening committees. I want to thank our senior staff. I want to welcome our newcomers to Montclair. I know Mr. Cipriano is on the on our um, our call today, and I want to thank also Dr. Goldblatt for being here for our director, our director of special education. And now, Dr. Morgan, I'll let you start us off, and I'll I'll finish us up with health and safety. Next slide, Dave, please. 
Good evening, everyone. As Dr. Pond stated, I'm Dr. Kalisha Morgan. I am the Assistant Superintendent for Equity Curriculum and Instruction, and I will be here to discuss the questions that were sent in regarding uh, academic and social emotional learning. So the, as we all know, the landscape of teaching and learning across New Jersey has shifted dramatically since the onset of COVID-19, of the COVID-19 pandemic. New Jersey educators have been working tire tirelessly to design more equitable and responsive school systems. Collaboration with families and community members as equal partners in learning will be imperative as we move forward. What you, the slide you see in front of you is uh, the learning acceleration guide that is provided to all school districts from the New Jersey Department of Education. Learning acceleration is an ongoing instructional process by which educators engage in formative practices to improve students' access to and mastery of grade level standards. The goal of learning acceleration extends beyond recovering. Normally, we always talk about remediation. This Department of Education is asking us to accelerate so that we can recover lost ground lost to COVID-19. It must be viewed as long-term, a comprehensive frame framework that anchors our academic, social, and behavioral interventions. interventions. It is our responsibility to ensure that all students regardless of their circumstances, receive a high quality education. To make this a reality for students in Montclair requires recognition of the fact that a history of inequitable access to opportunity has put students of color, low income students, English language learners, students with disability, and other student groups on the downside of long withstanding achievement gaps. Accelerating learning requires us to reaffirm our commitment to advancing equity for all. So the four principles of acceleration, I'm sorry, the graphic in front of you is designed to illustrate the interconnected nature of the four principles. Principle one, the conditions of learning, which is featured in the center of the triangle because research indicates that in order to increase student achievement, or academic outcomes, the student's social and emotional needs must be met. Principle two, improving equitable access to grade level content and high level resources for each student is at the apex of the triangle to emphasize the critical role it plays in preparing all students for post-secondary success. The two principles positioned at the base of the triangle are foundational actions educators must take to facilitate learning acceleration. These foundational actions are to pri prioritize content and learning by focusing on the depth of instruction rather than the pace, and to implement a K-12 accelerated learning cycle to identify gaps and scaffold as needed. Surrounding the four principles is a larger triangle in white, aligned to New Jersey's tiered system of supports, emphasizing that a positive school climate and culture, a strong district leadership and school leadership, as well as family and community engagement are essential for promoting quality instruction and learning. This positioning is intentional to remind school districts that the principles of learning acceleration should be at the core of each school district's implementation of their tiered system of supports. Next slide, please. Here in Montclair, we will ensure that learning principles and practices are supported or supporting student learning. So far, we had our summer learning programs. We had summer hike, summer step up, our middle school summer in intervention, our high school summer enrichment, credit recovery, and our uh, staple our uh, programs that's been here for years, our Mont Mont Montclair Public School Summer Enrichment Camp, and our Imani programs. Many of our students participated in these programs over the summer, and we hope that we can expand this through many years. 
starting in October, we will have our extended day, extended learning opportunities. Using our ESSA funds, we put money aside so that we can have after school programs as well as Saturday programs, Saturday art, arts programs. All of our students will be able to participate and transportation will be provided. I just reviewed our learning principles and practices with a focus on accelerated learning. Next slide, please. Our professional development plan is being developed by our department, the Department of Equity Curriculum and Instruction. We have so far scheduled several days of PD opportunities that will focus on the health and wellness of our staff and identification of support for our students. PD will also support the need for learning acceleration while addressing compensatory learning needs and ensuring equitable access to grade level content. We will focus on prerequisites, content and skills, scaffolding, scaffolding strategies, push in co-teaching models and culturally responsiveness. We are beginning our social emotional training uh, during our con continuity of services meeting. It was suggested that each school have a social emotional team, a leadership team. This came about because many school dish, some schools already had it, some schools did not. So in order for us to ensure that all students are being supported, we will be providing training for all teams at the end of the month. The training will be provided by Dr. Maurice Elias, who is the professor and director of the Rutgers Social, Emotional and Character Development Lab, as well as the co-director of the Academy for Social Emotional Learning in Schools. He will, start he will start the training by working with uh, the, each team on how to support teachers, students, and families. We will have our PD session starting in September. We will start with our teaching staff. As a, as a teacher, I'm still a teacher, although I'm not working with kids in the classroom, I believe that we must take care of our teaching staff first. So we will provide strategies on teachers for teachers on how to um, have self-care for themselves before we have them to learn strategies on how to work with students. So we will start with our teachers and then our teachers will learn on how to work with our students and families. Next slide, please. So our social, emotional, mental health, our new director of guidance, Dr. I mean, Ms. Susan Mattinson, Mattins, Mattins, Madison, she has uh, developed a social and emotional guide for our counselors, which she will share with them upon their return. Each building team, each building's iron arrest team would meet at a minimum of once a month. As I spoke to building leaders, they said, most of them stated they do meet once a week, maybe twice a month, but the minimum requirement is once a month to review students and families and to identify areas of need and support. Counselors will work with students and families who have emergent needs. School counselors will also review students' progress, attendance, and discipline weekly. They will coordinate by coordination by building administration of school counselors and child study team to discuss student trend need, trending needs. We will be using data to inform our to perform to inform our instruction as well as what is needed for our students. Child study team members will support current caseloads, but may be but may be made available to support other classified students and staff. Following two tier two strategies, forms will be available for students, parents, staff to complete if a student needs assistance. Students who have emergent needs will be addressed by district support services and referrals for outside services. Any student who were fully remote last year will participate in building orientation activities. We will also utilize our restorative justice services, especially focusing on SEL. Next slide, please. Other questions we received is what will happen if a student needs to go out or a class of students uh, through, through our pool testing uh, will may have COVID or has been exposed to COVID. The directions from the state is that if a district is required to exclude a student, a group of students or class or multiples, multiple classes as a result of COVID-19, 
While the school itself remains open for in-person instruction, the district should be prepared to offer virtual or remote instruction to those students in a manner that is comm commensurate with in-person instruction to the extent possible. Teachers will provide synchronous instruction when students are able to participate while in quarantine. Staff and students are expected to keep their parents, their cameras on, I apologize. If a student has underlying health conditions that will make it impossible for them to attend school, they may be eligible for home instruction per the process outlined in Code 6A or as required by the student's individualized education plan or 504 plan. In circumstances where school facilities remain open and in-person instruction continues in those classrooms that are not required to quarantine, those days in session will also count towards the district's 180 day requirement. Next slide, please. Another question that we received is, can students share supplies or can teachers hand papers and papers to students? Per our district physician, supplies will not be shared among students. Students can receive individual papers from their teachers only. Dr. Trim um, had an emergency during ESY today, so she is not available to um, speak about children with disabilities, so I'm going to jump in for her. I would like to thank this team because they work very, very hard to ensure that all students are included. Um, in the in our reopening plans. So for our in-class support students, students will attend school with their general education peers and remain in their classrooms for all subjects. They will follow the school start and end time each day. The in-class support teacher will support students in the classroom utilizing social distancing guidelines. This may include modifying work, individualized support from a distance, suggesting appropriate accommodations and other activities as indicated in the student's IEP. For students with paraprofessional support, please see the section below regarding the role of the paraprofessional during instruction, and that's on another slide. If students are in pull-out resources, they will attend school with their general, pull-out resource room, I'm sorry. They will attend school with their general education peers and remain in their respective classrooms for all subjects. They will follow the school's start and end that in time each day. The pull-out resource, pull resource room teacher will bring the students to their designated classrooms. For students with paraprofessional support, please see the role of, of the paraprofessional. Next slide, please. Our self-contained students will attend school for five days a week. They also will follow the school's start and end time each day. Students within the self-contained setting will receive instruction in general education classes in accordance with their IEPs, as if they're mainstream. Our preschool will attend school five days per week and they will follow the school start and end time each day. Community-based instruction. Students in the CBI program will attend school for five days per week. They will follow Montclair High School start and end time each day. Students, instructors, and or job coaches will wear appropriate PPE. Instructors and job coaches, job coaches will provide necessary support as outlined in each student's IEP. Related services providers. Related services providers will provide in-person services for all students. Related service providers will participate in all required meetings as per, NJ, as per NJAC 6A14. Evaluations as well as services will be in person. Related service providers will follow the protocols outlined in the evaluation section of this document. Child study team members will complete, perform, their in-person job responsibilities inclusive of evaluations in their designated space and or, like, or location. For staff who travel between buildings, the same protocols should be adhered to. Next slide, please. 
the role of the paraprofessional. The paraprofessionals will paraprofessionals will support students through participating in classroom activities, reinforcing individual student skills as directed by classroom teachers. For those students who require an increased level of one-on-one -on -one support, paraprofessionals will utilize the maximum level of PPE, mask, face shield, scrubs, gloves, etc. Building administrators will provide specific information to individuals that will provide the necessary support. Next slide, please. Evaluations. All Montclair Public Schools related service providers and child study teams are required to conduct in-person evaluations at their designated locations, utilizing the health and safety guidelines below. All PPEs, three-ply cloth masks and or shield must be worn throughout the evaluation and sneeze, sneeze guards are available if necessary. Upon completion of the evaluation, student will sign out and be escorted to designated outside pickup area. Testing materials will be sanitized before each evaluation. In, if additional evaluations are scheduled, an alternative room should be utilized. Evaluators will thoroughly wash their hands performing the, before performing the next evaluation. Dr. Harrison Crawford will talk about masks, but I do want to um, emphasize to parents with students of parents of students with disabilities that students who have a documented disability, which makes it difficult for the students to wear a mask, will not be required to wear one. Caregiver, caregivers should speak with their case manager. Next slide, please. Dr. Harrison Crawford. I think you're muted. Good evening, all. I guess it would help to unmute. <laughs> so for pool testing, again, this year, um, the Montclair Public Schools will continue with the uh, pool testing for students and staff who give consent. A schedule for pool testing will be developed. It's actually in the process of being developed, and we're developing it for September through December 2021. Before January of 2022, um, a new, uh, an assessment will take place and a new schedule will be developed um, if we're moving forward with the pool testing. Um, as Dr. Morgan alluded to, if there are positive COVID-19 test results, the protocols for communicating to parents and staff will be followed. Next slide, please. The masking mandate. And so masks are required for all um, staff and students in the buildings, regardless of their vaccination status, whether they're vaccinated or not. Students also, um, and I see this was added um, to the slide, um, as Dr. Morgan spoke about, if there's a disability, uh, communication will take place um, with the case manager and um, accommodations will be made. Next slide, please. For lunch. Um, at this time, for masking, um, I'm sorry, my slides were moved around a little bit. Um, at this time, lunch will take place outside as much as possible. And I think it's critical that we um, clearly understand as much as possible. Um, during inclement weather, lunch will take place in alternate um, locations such as the gymnasium, auditoriums, um, cafeterias. And social distancing with three feet of distance between students and classroom settings to the extent possible um, will be adhered to. Next slide. For transportation, masks must be worn by all students and staff on buses regardless of their vaccination status. And of course, this is in accordance with the CDC federal guidelines, federal order. Um, if occupancy allows, physical distancing between students on the bus will, re, will be maintained to the extent possible. Windows will be open to increase the airflow in buses um, and other transportation vehicles to the extent possible. And you see that's the ongoing theme throughout the presentation. Regular cleaning for our district buses as well as our contracted um, transportation vendor um, will occur, including the high touch surfaces on school buses, and that occurs on a daily basis. Next slide. Good evening. 
Yes, good evening all. Um, so if and when we have a positive case in school, um, <clears throat> myself, the uh, director of personnel, is going to work with the building principal as well as our district nurse to ensure that the contact tracing is done properly. Once contact tracing is completed, then the building principal will send out communication to all families impacted. Realize if your family is not impacted, then you will not receive a letter. The letter will also be sent out to all building staff. We will work in conjunction with our district medical doctor and the Montclair Health Department. We will continue to follow guidance from the CDC as well as our local health providers. We are also working on a voluntary survey for all staff to determine who has been fully vaccinated. Again, this survey will be voluntary. And as it was designated in the road forward, we do have a specific designated area that has been identified in each building to isolate individuals who become ill with symptoms of COVID-19 during the academic day. Thank you. Okay, um, so staff check-in. As we prepare to come in, our staff members have asked the question, what do they need to do in the morning before they arrive? All Montclair Public School staff will be required to complete the daily health screening form that is located on our district homepage prior to the start of the day. The form will be monitored daily by designated district staff members. So all staff members, please be sure to complete that form before you arrive in the morning. Thank you. And for our students, we will be requiring our, our students and families to complete the daily health screening form in parent access twice a week. Mondays and Wednesdays, all elementary schools will complete the form. Tuesdays and Thursdays, all middle schools and our high school students will complete the form. I don't see preschool, so I'm gonna put preschool students with our elementary students on Monday and Wednesday. Daily alerts and reminders will be sent out even on off days. So for example, our elementary schools are required to complete the form on Mondays and Wednesdays. You will receive reminders to complete the form. Please disregard the alerts and the reminders on the off days. So on Tuesdays and Thursdays, all elementary families, please ignore the alerts. Although your check-in with the district may reside on designated days, parents and guardians are required to monitor daily for symptoms. Students who come to school without filling, without filling out the daily health screening form will be directed to a designated area to complete a temperature check. There will also be a Chromebook, there will also be Chromebook kiosks on hand for students to log in and complete the form. Next slide, please. And Dr. Ponce. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. So cleaning our daily routine. So we're gonna be cleaning high and low touch surface areas with the EPA registered cleaning products, which is in line with the road forward cleaning and disinfecting state section. Again, we'll be cleaning high and low touch surface areas with EPA registered cleaning products, which is in line with the road forward cleaning and disinfecting section. Locations to be cleaned multiple times during the day, classrooms, hallways, nurses suites, isolation rooms, restrooms, cafeterias, main office, lobbies, vestibules, high touch surf areas included but not limited to, to be cleaned multiple times, door handles, push, push plates, light switches, desk and chairs, countertops, shelf, uh, shelving, handrail, buttons, telephones, faucet handles, toys and testing equipment. As you can see, we'll be cleaning a lot during the day. I'm gonna say this one more time. Daily routine with cleaning. 
cleaning high and low touch surfaces area with EPA registered cleaning products, which is in line with the road forward cleaning and disinfecting section. Locations to be cleaned multiple times are classrooms, hallways, nurses suites, isolation rooms, restrooms, cafeterias, main offices, lobbies, vestibules. High touch surfaces include, but are not limited to, door handles, push plates, light switches, desks, and chairs, countertops, shelving, handrail, handrails, buttons, telephones, faucet handles, toys, and testing equipment. Next slide, next slide, please. Disinfecting schools follow, disinfecting in our schools will follow standard procedures to disinfect with EPA registered products use against SARS, SARS COVID-2. Uh, Maintaining health and safety airflow. I'm gonna do this a couple of times this, this slide. On page nine in the road forward, it's our task to improve airflow to the extent possible to increase circulation of outdoor air, increase the delivery of clean air and dilute potential contaminants. Again, to improve airflow to the extent possible to increase circulations of outdoor air, increase the delivery of clean air and dilute potential contaminants. To bring in as much outdoor air as possible. Again, I'm crediting, I wanna credit that. I'm not using APA style of anyone out through who writes a lot, but I wanna just make sure you see where we're getting information from. The road forward page nine. Strategies to do so, work in mechanical ventilation, Open windows and doors. Again, I cite the road forward. Exhaust fans in, in restrooms and kitchens is a strategy that we've been brought to us and we will be implementing. Have activities as much as possible outside. This means as much as we can with classes and as much as we can with lunch and other activities. In addition to increasing our airflow, as stated in the road forward, we were also going to do some extra things here. The Enviro Cleanse air purifiers we used last year, although not stated in the road forward, but suggested in the road forward, we'll be using in rooms where the windows will be open. Our phase one plan will increase mechanical ventilation in areas where needed, where we do not have it. Again, our $2 million phase one plan will be increasing mechanical ventilation in areas where we do not have it currently and where, we, where it's needed. We are committed to improving our facilities and we're committed to improving it and it's gonna be more to come. We are committed as a district to move forward. I wanna go back over this slide again because I know this slide will get a lot of attention. And I wanna reference the road forward, which is gonna be on our website also with our presentation. The road forward airflow to improve airflow airflow to the extent possible to increase circulation of outdoor air, increase delivery of clean air, and dilute po potential contaminants. Bring in as much outdoor air as possible. Strategies they suggest, and we are also gonna implement, working mechanical ventilation, open windows and doors, exhaust fans in restrooms and bathrooms. Have as much as, much as possible, have activities outside classes and lunches. In addition, where we're using our windows, our EnviroCleanse air purifier with our UV lighting are in rooms where we have to open windows. Phase one plan, the $2 million plan is to put in mechanical ventilations where, we, where we're needed, and that's our plan. And according to our architect of record, this should be finished by the end of November. And also, we have a commitment in our district a commitment to improving our facilities. And we're working towards that every day to get things done. So thank you, Andre, if you can go to the next slide. Dr. Morgan, if you can finish with that and I'll finish with some questions. Well, I'll state it. There's the resources we have here, as you can see, I'm sorry. I was talking and I wasn't muted. <laughs> All right, Dr. Moore, go for it. Okay. The resources that are listed here are from the NJDOE, um, the Health and Safety Guidelines for the Road Forward, as well as the Learning Acceleration Guide. 
Next slide, please. I want to say thank you, but Dr. Borg, I'm going to take some time here to answer some questions. If that's okay, um, we have we have some more time, so I want to do so. Um, okay. And I'll ask some help from some of our our senior staff. So one of the questions we have in front of us is: Can you give any information about the minimal frequency of the minimum frequency of pool testing? When will when will it be scheduled and be re, when will the schedule be released to parents? So what I would like to do is I'll try to answer some of this, but I know we have have uh, awesome staff here who've been working on this and they'll hop in with me and correct any mistakes I have and then lead it also. So pool testing will follow the path we had in the spring. Uh, I believe that path was every other week. Am I correct by that, correct. Dr. Harrison Crawford? You are correct. And we are, we are working diligently to get it done. We've been in contact again with Ginkgo, our, our provider, but we have news that the state is looking to help districts pay for this. So although the state's got the information out there for this to pay for this, we still need to get it started. So we'll be going through those processes to get it started. I want to thank Dr. Harrison Crawford for leading us in this. And I have full, I'm fully supporting this work to get done. Because I, my goal is for us to start this in September. It's critical for us to continue to continue to mitigate and put mitigating strategies in across our, our district. Dr. Crawford, you have anything? Yes, so we're, we're hoping to uh, mimic the same process that we did last year. So last year we had the cohorts, Mounties and the Bulldogs. And so it was done by grade level every other week, um, but once with each cohort. We're hoping this year that we can do it once a, once a week, every other week to make sure that we get each grade in. Grade two, one week, we skip a week, then grade three, skip a week, grade four, and so on and so on to make sure that we cover all of the grades. And, but yes, the um, we're hoping to get some funding because um, that is that is a challenge um, with the with the um, kits and the swabs and all. So funding to make sure that this can occur uh, throughout the year is is one of the challenges. But we're excited that there'll be some funds, um, hopefully from the state. Thank you, Dr. Crow. Well, we have a couple more questions too around pool testing. One of the questions is: Will all staff? Uh, teachers be required to participate in pool testing? The answer so, to that question, I'm sorry, Dr. Right, no, go ahead. No, go, go for it. Yeah. You're, you're so, right, so the answer to that is no, it is based on consent. So all students, all students and staff, it would have to be parental consent for students and it would be um, staff consent. Uh, the form went out last year through the Genesis parent portal for students and um, we did a consent for staff through our um, website. And so based on that, um, we're able to do this, the sampling. So we don't, we don't have to have everyone's consent in order to make this effective. Thank you. And then we have another question around pool testing. Typically can be conducted outdoors or inside the building? Inside the building. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Yes, we, we did it at the doorway of the classrooms and we actually have um, staff, um, nursing um, nurses that um, perform the swab testing Con uh, through conducted it with the students in the, in the classroom. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cooper, I'll ask your help with this question. Will there be mandatory weekly testing of unvaccinated staff? Very good question, Dr. Pons. Um, <clears throat> at this point, we cannot do that. Um, I am working with our school district attorneys to see where the state is going with this. Um, but at this point, we cannot do that. So I want to make sure everyone understands that I've asked Mr. Cooper to work closely with our attorney on all personnel uh, questions around vaccinations, and he's been doing that. So thank you, Doctor. I mean, thank you, Mr. Cooper. The next question is: Who decides implement weather and eating outside? How are children who cannot eat indoors accommodated? So I'm going to take a jump at this question, and then I'm going to ask Dr. Dr. Morgan to help me out here because I know she works closely with the principals on the question around lunch. Um, who decides inclement weather and eating outside? Right now, we are the conversation we had just yesterday was to discuss what the uh, threshold would be in terms of temperature. Um, we uh, heated around 32 and 40 degrees. 
if it's raining, hard rain, then we know that no one will be outside. So other accommodations will have to be made. Um, we are working on tents for a light drizzle. The principal did state that students can possibly go outside if there was light drizzle, but we don't want anyone outside during, you know, rainstorms or anything like that. Um, and who decides what will happen if a child that can't go outside, maybe we can put them, um, I don't have an answer for that. That's something that we need to discuss. I really don't have an answer for that right now. Thank you, Dr. And I've, I've asked Dr. Morgan, like I've asked Mr. Cooper to work closely with individuals around these around these tough topics, and she has been doing so. So thank you, Dr. Morgan. And we're going to get questions that tonight that we may not be able to, to give an answer to at this time, but what we will do is get back to you with the answer to that question. So you will look for a response to that question um, in my up, soon to be, up, or soon to be, um, bringing back our weekly updates in multiple in multiple versions, not just in writing, but also on a podcast. I'm, I'm very interested to get started and to move forward with. So to move on to some more questions, vaccine questions. Is there a reason you won't mandate teachers to be vaccinated? So I'll get asked Mr. Cooper on help with this and then I'll I'll pop in. Yes, Dr. Pond, um, at this time, we cannot mandate um, our staff be vaccinated. Um, <clears throat> again, I'm working with our attorneys on this um, because there still are two reasons, um, two main reasons why individuals may not be vaccinated. One of them may be due to a pre existing medical condition that their own healthcare provider will not allow them to be vaccinated. And the other one could be due to um, a religious reason. And, and at this time, we have to take guidance from our attorneys and the state. Thank you, Dr. Pons. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Uh, we have a couple more pool testing questions and I will try to answer uh, a couple of them. But then uh, again, Dr. Harrison Crawford, if you could hop in and help me. Um, why is pool testing opt in rather than opt out? I will step, Dr. Harris Ruffy, you want to take that question, it'd be great, but also I'll be able to hop in and, and say some things I know. Right, so we weren't mandating our, um, when we talked with Jinko to understand the pool testing, um, the, we, we weren't mandating, we weren't looking to mandate all staff and all students to, um, to give consent. Um, so, so we offered it as a um, pilot, first of all, last year, um, you know, there wasn't there wasn't a discussion about mandating all you know staff and students to be a part of the pool testing, and budgetarily, I don't know if that is something that we would be able to do this year. Nor do I think, from my experience last year, that it's something that's necessary because it is meant to be a sample, um, you know, a, a sampling. And from you know the random samples, if you will, if something shows positive, then you know, the likelihood of, you know, COVID being in that classroom or that, you know, that cohort, um, you know, you can gather the information from that. So I'm not sure that mandating it would serve a, a different purpose, but, I, you know, I'm, I'm not clear on it. You know, last year was our first experience with pool testing. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Yeah. You're welcome. That's a wonderful answer and support that answer that Dr. Harrison Crawford just gave. Uh, pool testing is a, is a great way of us doing without having everyone take the take the, take the test. Um, the other thing is, is that when we looked into the legal aspects of, of testing, um, we ran up against the, the case of mandating. And, and so we were advised not to mandate, but to have voluntary. And so if we have a room that half of our groups volunteer, volunteer or, um, we're, or even a third, we're able to, to really get a sample of that room where it stands. And so pool testing can help us with that. Uh, another question is why is every student not tested every week? Again, uh, we'll say we're going to go to legal reasons why. I don't have the capacity to mandate it. This is my understanding. Um, if my understanding changes through our attorney, I will make a different statement. But at this point, what my understanding is through our attorneys, I cannot mandate that. So thank you. And we have more questions. So we are a hot topic tonight. Uh, let's see. Will aftercare be available. Dr. Morgan, you want to take this one or I can take this one? Or Dr. Harrison Crawford, because you're in charge of that area, you want to take this one. <laughs> yes, so we will, so our aftercare, YMCA will be providing aftercare on-site, before care and aftercare on-site as they've done in the past. 
following all the CDC protocols and, and procedures. Great. Dr. Harrison Crawford. Dr. Morgan, I think you had your hand raised. I'm yes, sorry. I did. I received a question um, about the document that's on the website, um, the reopening plan that's been up there since June 24th. This is part of that. So we'll be taking the comments from the public and the questions and making sure that all of the all of that information is going into the document. So I'm looking to have it updated no later than Monday. It is being edited right now because there were many hands in it that who worked on the um, re, who were, uh, people who were on the reopening team, and there were many different fonts and things going on. So I just wanted to have it edited before it goes out again. Thank you. So we have another question about the Wachung outdoor space. They currently do not have any. Why wait? Why the long wait to update mechanical ventilation? So we'll start with the Wachung outdoor space. Um, I know, and Dr. Morgan, if you can help me on this, I know you were working with the principals on, on this also. We're going to be buying, uh, purchasing tables um, to help school buildings, where there's not currently an outdoor space, to have an outdoor space for lunch. That's the first thing. So, Dr. Morgan, if you could speak to that a little bit, then I want to speak to the next question. You're on mute, Dr. Morgan. I was checking the email with the questions. What was the question? I'm sorry. Wachung outdoor space. They currently do not have any. Uh, I will have to speak to Mr. Crin about that because I was under the impression that he did he did have outdoor space. He never mentioned it during our principals meetings um, as recently as last week when we talked about um, when we talked about the lunches and he said he had a plan for lunch. But I, I wanted to let the public know also, Dr. Pons, that each principal will be scheduling a meeting for their individual school. Um, Dr. Harrison Crawford made a recommendation that they can use their school, what is it called? School Action Team. School Action Team for Partnership. School Action Team for Partnership meetings so that um, parents can get questions answered for the specific school that their child attends. Um, we're just making general statements right now as we cannot speak for each individual school, but each principal will be scheduling meetings with their uh, community, their school community. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. I'm going to go to the next question. Why the long wait to update mechanical ventilation? I'm happy to say we did not have a long wait. On May 17th, a plan was presented or a, a statement was presented um, around what we need to do with respect to monies uh, by one of our engineering firms. On June 17th, our board approved, I believe June 17th, our early June meeting, our board, or June 17th, 19th, our board approved our phase one mechanical ventilation phase, which has been done, it's been orchestrated by our, our architects, slash in, our architect and engineers, which is also uh, going out to bid, and which we will now we will be putting in place. So we are aggressively, aggressively, and I will say it again, aggressively moving forward with our ventilation pieces. And again, we ground our work in this work in reopening schools in the road forward. So please look at airflow page nine. There's some more questions. Let's see. The bullet point slide about catching students up wasn't covered. Can you explain? Catching students up. <laughs> I talked about, yes, it was covered when I talked about the acceleration of learning. I talked about that in the beginning and then I went to the slide, but all of those points were already covered in the first 15, 10 minutes of what I was speaking about. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Mm -hmm. Combinations will be made for quarantine students, but what if a student stays home for things such as the cold like symptoms until they've, until they've been tested? Will they have access to remote learning on a day-to-day -day basis? We are, are obligated by the, I'll go back to what I'm calling, I told my, my senior staff is our, 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 guiding, our guiding lights here. Um, there's very clear language in when to use remote learning, and we have to follow that language. So I believe we put a slide up about that, Dr. Morgan, I think we did earlier. These slides will be on our website, so you can go through it. And I think there's language in that slide directly pulled from our, um, our health and safety guidelines. So I'll go to another question. Lons, if I can jump in before you ask the next um, the go question. Go the it, question Dr. regarding um, Wachung. There is outdoor space, but I believe the question was regarding the field and the playground, and that is not ready. That's not ready yet. I don't have a date on that. 
but there is outdoor space um, once the field and the playground is ready. So the question is about the field and the playground or having lunch spaces. So I'm not really sure either, Dr. Morgan, with that, with that answer. I'm not sure either, but, but um, there, there will be space to eat outside. Okay, so there will be spaces to eat outside. Yes. Good, 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 good. All right, to the next question, will the kids be social distanced at lunch as well? Um, so we try to answer that question in our presentation. Uh, they will be social distanced to the extent possible, or um, and that's in one of our slides. So please review, view our slides and you will see that and you'll see the language where we pulled it from. The next, to be clear, the kids will stay in their classrooms all day or not move around room to room. Will the pool testing, I'll answer this question first. Uh, and please, Dr. Morgan, hop in when you get a chance. We have a regular scheduled school day. Um, kids will be moving around the school as they do, as they've done before, and we'll be at. And right now, the mask is a requirement, and uh, we'll be masking, having kids students wash their hands, uh, making sure they have enough water and those things to to, to stay hydrated. Um, but that's what we're moving for. So, Dr. Morgan, if you please, if you want to add to that, please do so. If not, we can move to the next question. Yes, you, that, that's it. Students will be able to move around the school building. Thanks, Doc. Uh, let's see. Um, be clear, students will, the kids will stay in their classrooms all day and not move. We answer that question. Will the pool testing be done using rapid test? Um, and how long before they get results? Dr. Harris Crawford, you want to take the answer with this one or I can hop in? Yes, so, so we get the results back within the week. Um, we actually send in the sample on the day that it's done. And within a week, within, well, actually, it's not by the end of the week, by that Friday, we have the results back and we actually box everything up in FedEx and off. Thank you, Dr. Harris. And it worked and it worked seamlessly last year. Um, it, if anything, we needed to order more supplies, but it worked seamlessly last year. Thanks, Dr. Harrison Crawford. So I'll answer this question. Will we share data? on voluntary surveys about staff vaccination rate. Mr. Cooper, you can help me uh, with this if you don't if you don't mind, and then I can also hop in. Sure, again, um, once <clears throat> we're able to receive that information, I will be working with our um, attorneys to find out if that information can be shared, if that in, um, and if we are given a clearance to share it, of course, it will be shared with the community. But again, I have to wait for our legal experts to give me guidance on that. Thank you, Dr. Pons. Thank you. And also, it's very important for us to realize this is medical information. Um, although it may be someone who's not willing to, who's not able to give her name, we have to be very careful sharing medical information under FERPA laws. So I would rather individuals trust us to give us information and for us not to break that trust. And so, especially since it's a voluntary survey. So I may step in, even if, even if, um, we're allowed to work in collaboration with our association, our teachers association around this topic, not to um, step on anyone's toes or to create an environment that people don't feel safe, a safe, safe emotionally or mentally around information. Um, is there a requirement for students to remain home after travel? Mr. Cooper, I'll, I'll let you try to answer this one because I know you're heavily involved, but then I'll jump in after you try to answer this one, sir. Sure. Um, of course, we are following all guidance from the CDC and our local health professionals. At this time, CDC guidance um, does not give any uh, mandates on if you have to quarantine after travel. So again, we have to follow guidance from the CDC and what is outlined in the road forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Uh, the, uh, the pool testing is back up. It's a hot topic. So will pool, t pool testing be completed by the nurse? How will, we, how will we prepare our young students? So last year we had nurses, um, nursing supervisor that coordinated the pool testing process. We had nurses, um, some retired nurses that worked for the Montclair Public Schools and other nurses that actually had the kits. They walked um, to the classrooms in the buildings. They had a list of the students who were who had consent to have the um, swabbing done, and they walked the the youngsters, the students through the process. So it wasn't the nurses that actually 
put the swab in the nose. Um, the students did it themselves and were instructed on putting it in a, a, the container that the nurse had. Um, and then the nurse sealed the container and moved on to the next classroom. So um, the instruct, I believe there was, um, I'm, and I'm not sure, so I don't want to, I want to just say that I'm not, I'm not sure on if there was instructions on um, ahead of time for students on how to swab. Um, but I do know that during the process, the initial process, the nurses walk the students through the process, what um, they expected the students to do. Thank you, Dr. Harrison Crawford. And I believe when we worked with Ginkgo last year, they did give us a video we, pl we put out. Some courses. Thank you. Thank you for refreshing my memory. I wasn't sure, so I didn't want to speak to it affirmatively. Yes. So we did have a we did have a video that Mr. Graber, you're right. We actually laughed about it. Yes. So we do have a video. Right. Thank you, Dr. Harrison Crawford. Let's see. I'm going to tackle a tough question here. Will kids need to wear a mask outside? And can they play on the playgrounds this year without social distancing? This is a tough question. And I'm going to say why it's a tough question. Uh, we want kids to be able to have a normal have a normal day as possible, to enjoy their friends and, and to be able to do a multitude of things. And so when the masking question comes up, we know what the governor stated about the mask mandate. At this point, when we work with our, our school doctor and have to listen to governor's mask date, we're going to have students wear masking mask outside. Uh, we're going to be we're going to be conservative and, and consistent because I want to make sure that we're in school five days a week, six hours a day. So yes, um, social distancing in playground. It's going to be very difficult for kids to social distance during playground. So we're not going to be out there saying hey because I know I have little kids and they'll bump into each other and that kind of stuff. Some of my boys will. It's going to be difficult. We're going to say just as adults if we can work with our students in the, the most emotionally safe way to help them play safely together. And where we where we can, we should social distance. Um, and where we're unable to, we should make sure we have other mitigating factors in place. So I hope that answered that question. Um, the next question is, how would you handle symptoms identification to narrow down if a child has a cold or COVID? Um, so again, uh, I'll go to uh, Mr. Cooper, sir. You're a hot topic today again, and I will support you with respect to after you answer that question. Yes, Dr. Pons, could you please repeat it just so I make sure that I'm on point with the answer? Sure. How would you handle symptoms identification to narrow down if a student has a COVID or has cold or COVID? Yes, that's what I thought. Okay, we're going to have to work with our nurses and our medical staff. Um, Believe me, I get it. It's a difficult topic, especially as the fall. There's still allergies around. And I know my kids have, they have very bad allergies themselves. And when they go to school, they may be sniffling, sneezing, which could mimic some of the symptoms of COVID. So we're going to have to work with our um, nurses and our medical team around that topic, Dr. Pons. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Um, what are our attendance guidelines and how will they make up miss work? Miss miss work if they have to quarantine. I'm let's just go with that. If they have to quarantine, um, Dr. Well, if, if they have to quarantine and they're able to do work, uh, teachers will implement the hybrid model for that classroom. Um, because according to the state, we must ensure that students who have to quarantine or have any any um, absences related to COVID, we must provide them with instruction synchronously. Um, so we must. Um, so students who uh, can do the work. I'm sorry, I keep hearing <laughs> in the background. Students who can um, who are not ill and just have to quarantine, they can log on students who are absent they will be marked absent um if they're not in school that day so can, can we explain uh, what quarantine means and uh i know mr cooper you've been heavily involved in this and then i don't have a question about how long and i know this is also a difficult question because that that also relies on the cdc so I'm going to try, Mr. Cooper, to talk about what quarantine means, and then I, if you well, if you could, because I know you're more heavily involved, and I want to come in after that to support your answer. Sure. So I'll start off with what the difference between quarantine 
and isolate is? Because I think that would help bring some type of a clarity to that question. Um, so if you have to quarantine, that's because of a possible exposure. That does not mean you yourself are positive. It means that, that again, you have been what the CDC and, and the medical professionals call as a close contact. That means you have to quarantine. Um, if you have to isolate, that means you yourself are COVID positive and you need to isolate to make sure you are around nobody. Now, <clears throat> in terms of the length of time that you have to quarantine for if you are a close contact, and this is specifically outlined in the letters that we send home. Um, so if you let me explain it for a minute, um, if you have to, so you have to quarantine for 10 days without a COVID test or seven days with a negative COVID test between days five and seven. If you choose to get your child tested, you must show the, the negative results on day eight, if you're returning to school. So again, um, you would have to quarantine for 10 days without a COVID test or seven days with a negative COVID test between days five and seven of that quarantine period. And I'm just going to jump in because I know that we have on our website, we had on our website, the COVID guidance. I'm reading it, the staff um, and student, and we update it based on what's changed under the CDC regulations and it gives various scenarios. So we will update this also with the current CDC um, guidelines, but it is exactly, it hasn't changed. It's exactly as Mr. Cooper just outlined. Those I was reading it along with it as he was stating it. So that document um, was on the website. It hasn't changed. There's other components of it that have been updated and we need to change those with the current um, changes under the CDC guidelines. Thank you guys. Here's a, another question. I know it's going to be a, a one of those topics for elementary schools. Will after school enrichment classes be allowed as sponsored by the PTA? Will outside vendors be allowed in schools and in cap in classrooms in, in gymnasiums? So I will state this clearly. We need to have engagement, parent engagement and engagement in our buildings. You will be asked to when you have these after school enrichment classes to follow our strict protocols and guidelines. Um, if you do not follow those strict protocols and guidelines, we will speak to you about discontinuing, but we want you to be involved and want you to be engaged in school. So we'll be saying yes, but you have to, have to follow our strict protocols and guidelines. Again, so we can stay open five days a week, six hours a day. And just another piece to that, is there's a lot of programming that we work programs that we work in conjunction with our community partners and other organizations. But we also have to keep in mind that under COVID, this is different. Um, and so there has to be time for cleaning. And so there, whereas in the past, we might have been able to accommodate um, outside vendors and other requests on a larger scale. We may not be able to do it this year and might have to make priority um, programming for those things that directly impact students, if you will, um, more so than say a uh, an outside event or an organization needing space. So I just, you know, things are gonna change a little bit um, uh, under COVID protocols. Thank you, Dr. Harrison <laughs> Crawford. So we are, we are prioritizing um, student engagement with our families and our kids. If an outside vendor wants to use our facilities or our classroom gyms, you may not get to be able to do that at that time. You have to reschedule a different time because we are prioritizing our families and our, our students to engage in our activities. And there will be cleaning going on because we'll be cleaning our buildings. And you and I forgot to say this, and that my buildings and grounds guys will be upset with me. If you have an event going on in the school, if you're a PTA sponsored event going on after school, we're going to ask you to really keep a tight control. Uh, on everyone involved in that event because they'll be cleaning rooms, other areas and spaces during that time. And we don't want anyone running in and out of there with us happening. So we're excited to get back into this.
But again, we have to follow our protocols and our procedures. Let's go to the next question. Volunteers in building in the build in the buildings this school year. Um, book fairs and PTA community events allowed to happen in schools. We talked about this, I think, just a few minutes ago. Um, we really want to get that engagement back going on with respect to book, book fairs, PTA community events. We just get to follow our guidelines. And our principals are principals going to decide when our principal will have a presentation to their families about how all this would work. All right, let's see this question. Will you consider asking parents to donate for outdoor tents? Will students have access to Chromebooks to take home for, for virtual remote learning? Let's do the tents first. Um, I'll consider anything as long as we can do it. And it keep us and it keep us open again, five days a week, six hours a day. So please reach out to me individually with that. The individual who has this question. And I'll get back to you individually and see how we can follow the proper process by getting the board approval and those kind of things and making sure we can use it and they meet their specifications that are designated for schools, such as fire retarding, those kind of things. Um, Chromebooks, Dr. Morgan, you can try to answer this one. I don't want to steal your thunder because I know you have a great answer for this about what happens when a group of students have to go remote because of quarantining. Dr. Morgan, I know you've worked well with Mr. Graber on this, so. Right. Our um, continuity of learning, um, we basically follow what is in the rule four that we must provide instruction. Um, so again, if we have a class of students, uh, a group of students, or even a teacher that needs to uh, stay home, quarantine, or isolate, and they are able to log on, log on, we will provide, um, the teacher will turn on their camera and provide synchronous instruction to the students at home similar to what we did in the spring. And students will have access uh, to Chromebooks to be able to take home. Yes, they will have access to Chromebooks to take home. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Um, and I have another one here about pool testing. Hey, so pool testing, um, and I'll try this one, but then I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Dr. Harrison Crawford, who's been just wonderful about this, to, to chime in on us. Um, are you saying that each class will be tested every, every other week in rotation, meaning that a grade grade school level, each class will be tested every 10 weeks. Um, more if you want to, Dr. Harrison, if you want to jump in, but I can also jump in to answer this question. What we did last year, so I'm not quite sure I understand the question fully. Um, but so, so what we did last year is we started with a particular grade, let's say, for example, grade one, and we test, they, they actually were tested one time. We started in the spring. Um, I believe it was May. They were, and they were tested one time, grade one. We didn't test for the second week. The next week was grade two. We didn't test the following week. The next grade was grade three. And so we carried it on trying to make sure that we um, tested at each grade level. It most likely will look different this year. That's why we're developing the schedule. Um, we may have more testing um, of a particular grade so that if it's if we start with grade one um, and we do all of the grades, don't kill me with my math, then the 13th time we test, we would be back to grade one. Um, if it's that many weeks, if we do it every week, if we do it every other week, we might do two grades a week. So I'm, that's the schedule that's being developed right now. But there's a lot of things to consider, um, you know, the, the 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 person power, if you will, budgetary considerations in providing materials and just, you know, getting getting a schedule up and up and running. So I don't have the definitive answer to that right now. Thank you, Dr. Harrison Crawford. And what I want to say is that last year we had the, the great chance of actually putting this out and rolling it out. So we have a process that worked very well for us last year. We're anticipating more students and more staff to be engaged in it this year. So we're anticipating that, but our process for last year worked very, very well. And if I can just, so I'll say this, is that we were able to get those results back fairly quickly and be able to, and that information goes to our principal and our school nurse and to the central office. So we know then that we can react quickly of what happens in that, and what happens in that room with those cohorts. So I want to thank Dr. Harrison Crawford again for leading that last year, it went very well. 
And uh, this year, we may have more people engaged. However, we're still going to follow that process. That process. And, we, and we certainly will share this information on an ongoing basis as we, as we you know, improve our communication. So this will, information will be available to parents and, and to staff. Um, last year, again, you know, was our was our pilot year, if you will. Um, but I don't, you know, anticipate um, us not being able to share any of this, you know, information with you and with the parents in the community and putting it on our website and making it available. Excellent. So, Dr. Morgan, I have a question about one-to-one -one tutoring. That was a bullet point. Um, can you elaborate on that for us? Sure. We will uh, be providing one-to-one -one uh, tutoring for our most needy students um, once we get back to school and we start doing some assessments and we realize that some students need uh, additional intensive intervention, we will be providing one-on-one, -on one-to-one -one tutoring for those students. Um, that was written into the ESSA grant, uh, ESSA 2 grant, and we will use those funds to do so. Thank you, Dr. Harris. But that, thank you, Dr. Morgan. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in trouble tomorrow. <laughs> no, she's, she's, a, she's a great woman. <laughs> so I have another question about the before and after care program. Uh, please repeat about the before and after care program. Is it available? So Dr. Harrison Crawford, I'm going to give it to you. I'm sorry. So I'm I'm looking at questions also. So that the question was, will before care and after care be available? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes. So I actually um, have been in touch just now with your assistant and with the YMCA. And that information is on our website. The answer is to that. It, the answer is yes. Um, before care and after care will be available at all sites, all schools. Um, in September. Actually, we already have a robust um, um, enrollment for the YMCA. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. <laughs> so related arts, could you re-explain the procedure for related arts for elementary schools? Will students be going to each classroom for their specials? So um, I can't speak for, I won't speak for each school, but I believe that is the plan. But each individual school will meet with their school community to let them know the plan. Because I don't want to say something that's broad and some schools may not be able to accommodate. So I will let each building principal speak to their community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. So here we go. I've got another, another question uh, regarding Parents will be allowed to volunteer inside and outside of school buildings with their kids as long as they follow CDC protocol. As long as they follow our district protocols, um, I do not see there's, there should be an issue with this. Remember, we want to engage our families um, in you know, our parent teaching groups, but we have to follow protocols. Please also work with your building principals on these things. I don't want to make, make, make a misstatement, um, but from my end, I want parent engaged. I want parents to be able to engage. I want out. I want people to engage in helping our students. But we have to follow our health and safety protocols. It's essential. And, and when there's not being yeah. followed, we'll be speaking with individuals like, hey, for us to have this community together, we have to follow these protocols together. So I'm sorry, Dr. Harrison Crawford. Yeah, no, I just wanted to jump in on that. Certainly, we want to utilize our volunteers. Um, I had gotten a similar question offline earlier. There are protocols in place, regardless, it wasn't based on COVID, where if there are volunteers over a certain amount of hours in the school, they have to go through fingerprinting and there's some other um, things that they have to um, do, um, you know, fingerprinting and some other checks. So uh, I just want to put that out there that, you know, if someone's looking to volunteer and, you know, they're, to they're told that they have to go to personnel or they have to get fingerprinting. Those are things that are already in our policies and regulations. It has nothing to do with, um, with COVID. So I know it can get a little complicated when we start to build layers on there. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Uh, there's a one question I really want to touch. And it's uh, what are families to do if they, for personal reasons, do not feel comfortable sending their children to in-person school? Please give us a call. Please call us as soon as you can. We want to address these head on and work with you collaboratively. Um, so my answer to that question is give us a call. I understand the fear. Give us a call. Pool testing. Pool testing something. I tell you. It is a, uh, what a question. Well, what we're going to do, I'm going to ask 
that we are able to just do a memo around pool testing to give out. I want to make sure people we answer the questions. So in the memo, we'll have we'll be answering the questions that we receive because I don't I don't want to um I want to make sure we're we're getting you're getting the we're getting clarity. You have something in writing that you can refer back to with respect to pool testing because for me it's a it's a very important mitigating factor that I'm a big advocate for. So we want to make sure we, we get those get that the, get that down on paper for you. So I'm going to hold back on the pool testing questions. And so we're going to have a memo out to families by uh, I have the board meeting on Monday. So by latest Wednesday of next week around pool testing. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Harrison Crawford, for the thumb ups because I looked right at you. I was like, oh, and you give me a thumbs up. So thank you. Is virtual learning only if the teacher or the entire class has to quarantine? Uh, Dr. Morgan, if you could. You could hit this question for us. I know you did in a slideshow, but if you can go back and reiterate what you said in the slideshow. Yes, virtual learning is only if it's COVID related. We cannot do, um, the governor has not given school districts the go ahead to offer virtual learning under any other circumstance. Great. Um, another one was, will the, will the teacher, will, Will the teacher be teaching to a screen always or only if the class has to quarantine? Oh, only if a class has to quarantine. We're not we're, we we're hoping that we don't have many cases. We don't want teachers teaching to a screen of students. Um, but if if a student or students need to quarantine, we are mandated to do so. But we do not want teachers doing what they did during the hybrid over the spring during hybrid uh, learning over the spring. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. And I, this other question, and I'll answer this one. This is, has the district explored seeking additional funding from parents to increase testing frequency? Again, this individual, if you can please email me personally, uh, I would love to have that discussion with you about uh, additional funding with respect to testing. So thank you. And let's see, proper mask wearing. Oh, oh. what is the policy for improper mask wearing? How will proper mask wearing be taught? and reinforced. Can I first try to tackle this, guys, before I hand it over? So it's important that uh, we wear our mask properly, and it's very important we do so. So I'll be asking my staff um, also to do what we did last year with respect to a presentation or a slideshow we can share across the schools about how to properly uh, wear a mask. Uh, for our students, but also we need to also have we will have proper mask breaks for our students and for our staff because I wear a mask all the time and I know at times you need to you need to breathe and we need to take, have these mask breaks for our students and staff so they can take their mask down, spread out, breathe a little bit, have some water, and uh, to see about everyone's mouth and chin. I kind of enjoy seeing the people's mouth and chins these days. I haven't seen it sometimes in a long time. So I want to answer that question, answer that question. Dr. Morgan, if you also want to hop in, but I want to jump into that question. On the mask wearing? Yes. <laughs> no, I, I, I like your answer. I like the videos. I like um and I and I don't know. And I don't know if we spoke to our nurses i don't think we have so maybe they can go around and demonstrate to students how to properly wear their mask so, so i'm going to jump in thank so, you okay so through our through our um podcast or through our our um our vi our visuals um our you know all of our staff will be trained um and in the training it's i call it training but it's simply demonstrating the proper way to wear a mask which teachers through their awesome instruction will turn key to their classroom by standing in front of them and, and showing them the proper way to wear a mask. And, you know, we all need reminders at times. So those reminders will come from the teachers and staff um, when we see children in the hallway, you know, or our colleagues or, you know, whatever it is. But it will be something that it's, you know, that everyone will have the understanding of how to wear the mask. We anticipate having posters in the buildings that show the proper mask wearing, similar to what they have in, you know, when you walk in offices and doctor's offices. So I, I think we'll, I feel confident that um, everyone will have a, that will be an issue on proper, um, the proper way to, to wear a mask. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Okay. 
So we're going to have one more answer, one more question. And I want to just thank, uh, before we do that answer that question, I want to just thank our senior staff um, for answering these questions for our families, uh, for us being uh, just transparent to the point. So I want to thank you guys already. And uh, hold on, I think I got a couple of things popping. I saw Dr. Morgan's hands raised. So Dr. Morgan, go ahead. I don't want to cut you off. No, I know you were doing thank yous, and I just, I just wanted to thank the committee. Um, particularly our volunteer parent groups, uh, parents who volunteered. Um, we took recommendations from different groups and, you know, we've been meeting consistently for the past four weeks, um, sometimes 8 a.m. in the morning. And I just want to thank those parents who volunteered their time to give their input to this plan. Um, we will continue to meet, as Dr. Pond stated, this is an ongoing um, committee right now through uh, September of 2023, so it's actually two years. Um, but I just wanted to publicly thank the parents who, um, and I can't think of everyone's names, so I'm not gonna start naming names because I will forget someone and that would be embarrassing for me. So you know who you are. Um, we will publicly thank you with the letter out to our community and thank you again for your time. So Dr. Morgan, I would like to have this one, one, this one question in, uh... Before we end it all, is uh, will food service be made available at school? So it's again five days a week, six hours a day. Yes, school services will be available at school. Food services will be available at school. And um, I want to thank everybody. If we didn't get to your question, we will be answering those questions via uh, email or a memo that goes out. We will be starting again our weekly up our weekly updates or our weekly letters that go out. We'll be doing that in a variety of ways this time. Uh, podcast is a happening thing. So although I'm almost 50, we're going to be happening with podcast and moving forward. Um, again, thank you so much for staying out, stick with us for, for so long. And we our email chain is still open. We'll be still looking at these emails. We're sitting out as a group, um, finding our themes and getting out to our family's answers. Um, I'm excited. And I want to end with this. Five days a week, six hours a day in person, but we are prepared if something happens in a quarantine. Five days a week, six hours a day. Have a wonderful evening, everyone.